So, welcome to our 2023 speaker series presented by the New Jersey chapter of the Fulbright Association. I'm Pat Hutchinson, president of the chapter. This afternoon, we are delighted to host Dr. Sophia Wilson, Associate Professor of Political Science at Southern Illinois University. Her topic is one that haunts us daily as reports from the ongoing war in Ukraine continue to garner headlines. Events in Ukraine are particularly heartbreaking to the Nashkovs, the refugee family of our New Jersey Fulbright chapter has sponsored for the past 10 months. We hope that Dr. Wilson's presentation will help us understand how this and perhaps other global conflicts have come to dominate international affairs in the 21st century. Dr. Fiona Sitkin, member of the New Jersey Fulbright Board of Directors, originally from Ukraine, will tell us more about Dr. Wilson. The Fulbright Association is comprised of current and former recipients of Fulbright Awards and other supporters of international education. New Jersey has over 400 active Fulbright alumni and friends, as well as thousands of people who live in New Jersey and have traveled abroad on Fulbrights. Additionally, New Jersey is something of a magnet for foreign visitors who come to visit to live and study here. In 2021, nearly 20,000 foreign students came to study at New Jersey's colleges and universities. Exchanges like these benefit our state economically and educationally. These visitors' economic contributions come to over $617 million. In 2021, roughly 60 New Jersey students and faculty members received Fulbright Awards uh, for foreign study and teaching. Fulbrighters represent virtually every field of interest and come from over 165 countries. What ties us together is a commitment to advancing mutual understanding, tolerance, and peaceful relations worldwide. This series of webinars features current Fulbrighters, alumni, and friends sharing their experiences, interests, and expertise. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished guests, Dr. Sophia Wilson and Fiona Sitkin, who will introduce her. Thank you. Um, thank you, Pat. Thank you so much. Um, yes, uh, today I have a distinct pleasure to host our outstanding guest, Dr. Sophia Wilson. Sophia is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. She is also president of the American uh, Association for Ukrainian Studies. Sophia Wilson was a visiting scholar at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute in 2015. She also taught at the Harvard Ukrainian Summer Institute in 2017 and 2019, which is a big honor in her field of studies. Most importantly, Dr. Wilson's upcoming book called Maidan, Ukraine's Democratic Revolution, reveals interactions between the state and the grassroots revolutionary movement, the society at large, as well as Russian state propaganda. Dr. Wilson's articles appeared in the Research of Social Movements, Conflicts and Change, the Journal of Law and Courts, and also Post-Soviet Affairs, as well as other academic values. Not to forget, and this is a note to our attendees, you will be able to ask questions, printing them in chat, and we'll discuss everything, everything, everything after the presentation as usual. Now, without further ado, I give you Dr. Sophia Wilson. To you, Sophia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Fiona, for your generous uh, introduction, and thank you very much to uh, Patricia and to uh, Fulbright New Jersey chapter for inviting me. It's an honor to speak um, here, and I am very happy to share my um, research that will be um, um, and the, the book that based on my research about the Maidan revolution uh, will be coming out uh, next year. 
So I have conducted over a hundred of uh, interviews with, with revolutionaries who took part in this very revolution and uh, th that took place in the winter of 2013, 2014. Um, I also conducted um, I also collected a number of legal documents. Um, I attended court hearings um, and um, it took me years to really, I wanted to be very thorough in trying to understand um, what took place there, why people were motivated to risk their lives um, in order to oppose the state. So what was uh, quite uh, fascinating uh, to me or quite interesting that in the media, when we hear about the Maidan revolution um, that took place almost uh, 10 years ago when it uh, when it started, um, in the Western media, uh, when you hear sort of brief references to the Ukrainian Maidan revolution, it is discussed um, as a as a protest movement um, that was in reaction to the um, Yanukovych president at that time who refused to sign the agreement with the European Union. Now, this was true that that triggered protests. What was interesting as those protests were actually um, dying down, the organizers said that um, the the um, movement um, should um, now be transferred in, in working with um, upcoming presidential campaign. They took down the stage. They they took down um, everything, really. And uh, there were only a couple of hundred uh, students who were left um, at um, that time, at the end of November. But oddly enough, at the very end of November, in the middle of the night, um, the police surrounded those few protesters who really remained. Mostly it was very young people, it was the elderly, um, who were just sort of left there to, um, to, <clears throat> to, to discuss and talk about it. It was no longer really uh, so much of a protest. But the violence, the brutality against those few who was left um, was really a shock to everybody else in Ukraine, because the level of violence um, that took place on that night really exceeded anything that Ukrainians have experienced uh, during the years uh, since Ukraine gained their independence um, in 1991. And the images of the specialized police who were, like you see right here, this was the image from that night where policemen are, are beating up, uh, right? Clearly somebody who is unarmed and an um, elderly person um, who was there. Similarly, young people were were beat up, um, there were young um, students, regardless of their age and gender, um, they were surrounded and they were beaten. Some were able to get away and they had to run. Some ran as far as the monastery where they had to climb the gates and seek um, refuge in the, <clears throat> in the monastery. And uh, really a, a scene from uh, medieval Europe uh, rather than um, what we think um, right, a, a peaceful and democratic country, which um, Ukraine was at the time. Um, Yanukovych, of course, um, uh, under his rule, um, the authoritarian measures started increasing, even though he was elected through democratic means. Um, but it was that night um, that changed Ukrainian history because um, right on that day and the day after, um, we have um, at least half a million and some estimates um, um, approximated 800,000 people who came to the capital of Ukraine from all over the country to protest that police brutality. Now, there were demands to stop the brutality, to release those who were detained, and not only people were beaten, many were detained and um, thrown in jail. Um, people were demanding to uh, detain those and also punish those 
um, who were responsible for this violence. But instead of responding to this, um, the government responded, the Yanukovych administration at that time responded very cynically, um, claiming that uh, there was no violence, but rather um, they were trying to set up a Christmas tree, um, which was cause uh, was a, a blatant, blatant lie. But most importantly, um, and very sadly, the government, rather than stopping its brutality, uh, continued to increase it. Um, and with such a, such measures, uh, people, rather than going home, decided to stay. And now it was no longer just pro uh, just protests. It turned um, it turned into. Um, truly fascinating grassroots mobilization uh, with wide range of tactics and actors within that uh, newly built resistance uh, movement. And um, it wasn't organized uh, by anybody. Quite on the contrary, when some politicians, um, some public figures were trying to uh, claim um, sort of ownership of organi or organizing or being so-called in charge of this movement, they were pushed away. Um, the government, um, if uh, even opposition politicians were trying to speak to uh, the people, um, people said they were tired um, of this um, um, of this sort of um, establishment that cannot provide them with uh, democracy. So instead. Um, there were multiple hundreds, really, of civic initiatives that started building on the spot um, that whose major aim and really the most important fundamental aim was to maintain the protest. There were those who organized the kitchen. Now, what did it mean to organize the kitchen? Um, there really were multiple jars where those who would come, um, even if they would come for five minutes to Maidan, uh, many would donate money and drop, uh, you know, from a couple of um, cents, so to speak, to um, to uh, to you know, ten dollars. So it was lot of multiple donations from um, really uh, multiple people, and that money then other activists would go and purchase food and then deliver it um, back there where lots of volunteers would work together um, to make sandwiches, to make uh, to make food for the protesters. Um, there were those who started organized housing. It was fascinating to interview the revolutionaries as one of the young um, activists I interviewed, uh, she said, well, I really didn't do much. Uh, my job was just, um, and she did as a, so obviously a 100% volunteer, she did not get paid for that. Um, what she did was she was connecting those who said, we live in Kiev and uh, in the capital of Ukraine, here's my address, I can host somebody for free. And then somebody else would come and said, we came from other places, we've heard, um, you can put us in touch with those who are willing to host us for, for free. Um, and they... Um, this became so successful at, at putting together those uh, sort of volunteers to protest and volunteers to host um, that they built a database where um, built on complete trust. Uh, and um, in fact, I asked her, well, how many people uh, did you house through just your own civic initiative? And she said, well, I know exactly. It was, uh, you know, and she gave me the number of over 200,000 people were housed just through these, um, uh, you know, a few young people who were recent graduates um, who would come up, with, who came up with that system, and then they volunteered on the square of, of putting people together. Um, there were lots of people with um, IT training um, who now were able to um, connect um, those who would offer housing or those who would help with kitchen or those who would deliver um uh, lots of um, uh, lots of materials that um, 
my dad is really neat. And for the most part, it was just to stay on the square. Uh, either it is to stay warm or to stay fed or to stay connected. Um, there were also those who were in charge of the stage. They were um, famous singers who were singing there to keep the spirit up. Um, there were others who organized Maidan University um, and, and invite lots of speakers and um, those who were protesters uh, could um, just come and listen. Um, and therefore it became a community, um, a Maidan community where people would um, come together and so many of them said that they had fascinating um, discussions about the meaning of democracy, about what they were um, fighting for. And in fact, there were multiple groups who started self-organizing to deliver that message to the state um, and the community um, at large, whether it's um, the neighborhood or um, Ukrainian community at large. Um, there was those uh, with, with Ukraine being highly educated um, um, society, they were putting all of those uh, skills in order to um, stream uh, lots of um, right, so sort of video of what was happening on the uh, Maidan Square, because of course the Ukrainian government, Yanukovych administration at that time, um, obviously was uh, presenting a very false uh, picture of what was happening there, or very often, in fact, uh, the, the major TV, the state TV, uh, Ukrainian state TV at the time, often would not cover anything of what was going on in Maidan, pretending uh, that, in fact, that is not happening only, there are just a few people there. Um, there were artists who would um, stay connected, and they would... Um, they would uh, talk to, um, they would send, they would represent the message of the Maidan and what is Maidan um, fighting for um, to the larger community. Um, there were lawyers now who mobilized in order to um, help pro bono completely for free um, to those who were detained by their state um, and were held in horrible um, conditions. And finally, many of those who mobilized, they said, we need to protect people from being beat up by the police in the future. So there were those who started organizing self, what they called self-defense um, units. Um, there were those who would organize legal aid. Um, there was separate movement of uh, what, what was called Automaidan. It's it's lots of cars uh, that in you know, columns of cars were traveling together with um, Ukrainian flags um, as uh, the Ukrainian flag became the, the the symbol of the movement. There were those who would protect, uh, there were lots of medics who would provide um, um, aid for uh, also completely for free as volunteers. And there were also those um, in severe cases, people would um, end up in the hospital but that's where lots of police would go after they would beat up those protesters. Um, they knew that injuries were very severe and they would try to go to the hospital. So that's where volunteer lawyers would be to defend those people uh, rights. Um, that's where the self-defense uh, self unit uh, would be to prevent um, the police from detaining people and grabbing them and um, out of um, the hospital. So that's where, and when the lawyers would um, see that they are not capable of stopping the police, they would call their friends who are the journalists who would come and, uh, you know, literally shove the camera in the face of the police and obviously um, applying the social pressure on the um on the uh, police and in that case of course it was much harder for the police to um to arrest uh, though so it was really a um very well coordinated movement even though it was again a completely a grassroots mobilization um it was not organized from the top uh, but it was very much bottom um, bottom-up movement that was based on this uh, newly regained trust um, between the participants of the Maidan revolution because they had a, a clear understanding of what they were um, fighting for. So what were they 
um, uh, fighting for the um, repression, the state repression became uh, much stronger. Um, it only increased rather than decreased over this month. Um, and not only now people were beaten and not only snipers were used to blind purposefully people, they would uh, throw flashbang grenades, uh, grenades with uh, nails tied up to them and they were thrown exactly at people. Um, so it would uh, lead to severe um, images. Um, but additionally, on January 16th, the state um, the, par the Ukrainian parliament passed um, the dictatorial uh, truly laws where people were not allowed to protest, where people were not allowed to drive in a column of five cars or more, where people were not allowed to criticize the state. Um, and bizarrely enough, people were not allowed to wear helmets um, because now people would start wearing helmets to protect themselves from police violence. Um, and therefore, helmet uh, became a symbol of a protester. Um, so the law included uh, a, a, um, a prohibition to wear hard um, hats. And after these laws were passed, by the way, with uh, severe uh, procedural violations, as instead of uh, following um, following the procedure, it was just voted by show of hands by the uh, party that was controlled by the um, Yanukovych administration. Um, a few days later, and now we have again um, hundreds of thousands of people on the street. Um, and here again, um, traveling from all over the country and stating very clearly, um, we do not support um, such blatant uh, violations of our constitutional rights. We do not support such violations of our um, rights to expression. And um, as uh, sort of being Ukrainian, so to speak, um, those uh, who lived through uh, decades of um, Soviet repression, um, often humor is uh, used um, as a very important weapon of uh, resistance. And so you can see here how many people on that day, uh, January 19th, um, came um, with uh, pots or scuba diving um, you know, hats on their uh, gear on their um, on their heads to ridicule the law, um, to send a very clear message that we will not accept this new law. We will not accept these new terms of legality. We see what you are doing um, and we will never let this go. In fact, in the, uh, through the interviews and the um, survey that um, I conducted, um, what became very clear is that, uh, and the question that I asked here is, um, what do you believe would happen if Maidan would have failed, if Maidan movement would have failed? And overwhelming majority of people, right? So we have 88% of respondents believe that future election results would be rigged by the state. So they clearly saw um, Yanukovych's government that is trying to consolidate authoritarian regime. And in fact, during those three months um, of the revolution, um, the Ukraine uh, under the directive of Yanukovych turned into authoritarian state with authoritarian laws and repression, um, severe repression um, of um, those who are challenging the state. Uh, overwhelming majority of respons respondents believe that if Maidan would have failed, the violent repression and detentions of peaceful demonstrators would become constant state practice. Um, they would believe that suppression of freedom of expression and the press would become constant state practice. So therefore, it is very important to remember that Maidan revolution was Ukraine's democratic revolution. It was a grassroots social movement to restore democracy because during those months, um, Ukraine under the um, under the reign of Yanukovych's administration became a truly authoritarian state. 
Now, what was, what was, what I found very interesting as I was interviewing so many revolutionaries um, and learning about their story and learning about why they were there, I'm, um, I learned uh, through this inductive study that Maidan and therefore um, perhaps all revolutionary uh, movements should be looked at as a state society dialogue. Now, we often think of the word dialogue that uh, presupposes a conversation that looks for a solution, but we do need to remember that, um, and I use the term and uh, the word dialogue in, in its broader uh, meaning where every action, um, not just words, but every action is a message. And especially every state message is, every state action is a message. And not only excluding, but very much including violent repression. It is specific message that the state is sending to society. State violence against this, against a certain against an individual is not directed only at a certain individual, but rather it is directed at the rest of the society, sending a message of a threat um, that um, similar similar protests, similar um, anti-state movement will be met with similar violence. So it's a threat and it's also an attempt to assert new rules. Um, similarly, social protest and court battles, um, which I've studied very extensively, is a message of social rejection of new state rules. Um, so, therefore, when people came to Maidan, they tried to approach the police um, and tried to convince them to uh, join the people. They talked to each other about the meaning of democracy. And they also talked about trying to, they talked to each other, um, trying to understand what the new state presents, the, the new rule under the Yanukovych. And um, therefore the um, state violence, state repression, um, in order to understand whether certain repression will meet a certain response um, and why does certain repression causes a revolutionary movement, we need to understand how that repression is interpreted. Um, right? So in democratic society, um, you can witness some police violence, but it doesn't necessarily lead to revolutions because it is assumed um, often that certain police violence and violations is a, is a mistake within the um, system and it can be fixed within the system. Versus for Ukrainians at that time, with Yanukovych's um, um, attempts um, to consolidate authoritarian regime over the years and now using violence to suppress, this was now interpreted as an attempt to um, establish and consolidate um, uh, for a long time to come a dictatorial state. And therefore, social response um, was that of uh, challenging the state um, and then essentially embracing violence in order to stop the state because they believed if the state would not be stopped, um, they will forever leave, uh, live in an authoritarian um, state. And uh, here I wanted to present for your attention um, quite um, a, a fascinating excerpt from an interview I had with a um, lawyer um, who said, um, I would, uh, I always ask them, meaning the, um, those he was defending in court, I always ask them the following questions. Um, Neither you nor I can predict how long these repressions will last, one or two days or a month or years and decades as in Belarus and Russia. Are you aware that as soon as you submit your application, you will be filed, you will be on this list? Do you understand that the perspective um, to win this legal battle is zero until the regime changes? And then I would add, do you understand that what you're doing is necessary? It is the only way to neutralize the system. Um, and this reflects multiple of uh, 
uh, discussions that lawyers told me um, they they had with with their um, clients who would um, who would fail uh, because the state was that repressive they would uh, detain them uh, despite um, despite sort of obvious violations but it wasn't about winning individual battles it's about it was about not giving up. So we can see from this quote, which is, which is quite representative, the consciousness that lawyers had of their inability to punish the state offenders in that given, given legal environment, right? You say, you know that we will not succeed until the regime changes, right? And nevertheless, they were determined to break the system. So these lawyers were working for pro bono. They understood this is not about this case, but it has to be about the avalanche of cases in courts um, and continuous resistance to the state in order to send a very clear message that the new terms of legality would not be accepted. Um, very importantly, religious clergy um, also made a number of statements. And um, what was interesting to me in their speeches, they would draw the moral boundaries of state society relations along the lines of constitutional rights. So, for example, one of them said evangelical Christians cannot stay neutral when state organs abuse their powers, when students' blood is spilled, courts make illegal decisions and legal enforcement agents protect the government rather than um, the people. So therefore, it is very important to remember that Maidan is indeed a was a revolution and not just um, a few protests, um, right? It wasn't just protest. And at most importantly, it cannot be summarized as pro-EU protest, but rather pro-democracy protest. Now, classic definition of a revolution involves two elements. It has to be a mass movement, and that mass movement um, has to result in a regime change. So indeed, it was a mass movement. Altogether, they were um, approximately 4 million people who participated, right? So 10% of the entire population of the country. Um, and that evolved into an entire grassroots movement. So there's no doubt uh, whatsoever that there was a mass movement. But we often leave out the fact that there was a regime change that was considered be, uh, that, that, that took place because the institutions that were there um, leading up to the revolution under the changes uh, to the constitution, for example, that um, were done under the Yanukovych's guidance, but especially during those three, three months, um, laws, judicial rulings, law enforcement behavior became authoritarian throughout the winter of 2013 and 2014. Um, as I talked about January 16th laws, um, I talked about court uh, trials where there were continuous blight and violations of due process. Um, and of course, uh, police violence now reached entirely new um, level with illegal use of weapons, uh, torture, um, and then live ammunition and toward the end, uh, use of snipers to shoot at the protesters. So it, it became sort of an entire system of um, extra legal uh, repression. And so Maidan social movement reverted Ukraine back to democracy. Um, but with the success of the revolution, with the success of uh, Ukrainians gaining their democracy um, back, it, it did bring the social change. Um, so not only a, um, a positive political um, system change took place, um, restoring democracy, but civil society was the experience um, of the Maidan movement uh, really uh, grew after that. Um, but also there was a clear message that Ukrainians were willing to defend democracy with the risk um, of their own um, lives. But this, of course, was a bad precedent, so to speak, for authoritarian uh, neighbors, uh, most specifically 
um, Kremlin got concerned that this could be a bad example um, for those in Russia, but perhaps even more, unfortunately, um, for um, the, the history that was to come um, after the Maidan revolution is that um, winning democracy for Ukrainians obviously meant um, that they were to... Uh, they were regaining their sovereignty because those uh, previous presidents um, of Ukraine um, who would choose more authoritarian measures would always help their, uh, would always find their help in the uh, Kremlin. Now, as Ukrainians were gaining their democracy, they went fighting so hard for their democracy that was a very clear message to the Russian government that we want democracy, and that means we no longer are interested in the Russian um, uh, control of Ukraine and Russia setting up uh, puppet regimes um, in Ukraine, which was the case for Yanukovych. And so that very much weakened uh, the possibility uh, for the Kremlin to control Ukraine. Um, and as a result, two days after the revolution, um, Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, now, we often forget that and often um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is marked as February of 2022. But of course, we need to remember this was just a change of tactics. Um, Russia invaded Ukraine in the February of 2014, annexing Crimea and setting up coups in the areas of uh, a number of areas in eastern Ukraine, um, hoping to um, gain control of um, entire half of Ukraine. And then it succeeded only in the cities of Donetsk and um, Luhansk. Um, where the sort of bandits now were running with the collapse of state institutions, uh, bandits were controlled by um, Russia and um, um, Russian troops, uh, Russian ammunition was um, there and Russian troops would occasionally uh, be there to um, to promote uh, <laughs> this um, regime. Now, um, this was not necessarily that um, easy with establishing. So I'm um, was establishing full Russian control um, of Ukraine, and in fact, uh, Putin um, failed. And most of the places they were trying to set up similar coups, uh, people stood up again with the risk of their lives um, to resist. Um, and that failure, I'm. Um, however, led to Putin only develop and come up with new plans on um, how to um, promote its military control um, in Ukraine and for the uh, to control Ukraine, invade Ukraine militarily and control it and occupy the whole country of Ukraine. And for the um, eight years after the uh, Maidan revolution, um, Russia... Um, unleashed its aggressive propaganda against Ukraine um, and then um, invaded, as you know, on a full scale. Um, so very often when uh, uh, folks look at the Russian propaganda, they get surprised. Uh, why is their language of denazification? People start looking for mysterious Nazis. Uh, um, in Ukraine, but and and some stored lots of journalists did lots of thorough work to show that no, of course that is not the case in Ukraine. Ukraine is democratic, um, and um, human rights, of course, were protected um, on an infinitely higher level than they were in um, Russia, which of course uh, remained authoritarian regime. So. What is important to acknowledge is that Russian systematic propaganda about the Maidan movement and about Ukraine um, has characteristic of genocidal ideology. Um, Jonathan Maynard's um, work is excellent at showing the characteristics uh, based on previous scholarship um, about um, 
um, propaganda that uh, promotes mass uh, violence, he comes up with uh, six major characteristics of genocidal uh, of ideology that promotes mass violence. It is dehumanization, guilt attribution, and threat construction when it is speaking about those uh, about the victims of the forthcoming genocide. And also the way they characterize their own actions, there are three other characteristics that is de-agentification, virtue talk, and um, future bias. So Maidan was presented um, very systematically, very consistently um, by the Russian TV um, and, and multiple other media sources as those who that uh, completely opposite to what actually took place rather than um, showing that it was indeed a pro-democratic revolution that um, all these lies about the movement were spread, that it was supposedly hijacked by fascists, um, that also that it that Ukraine were puppets of the West. Now you need to um, again. There were lots of those who would try to say, well, Ukraine Americans didn't organize it. You see, it was grassroots movement. But of course, not only that is false. Uh, you need to remember that that characterization of Ukrainians who are incapable to make their choices um shows them as inferior. Um shows them as those. Who can know who absolutely are incapable of having their own state, therefore they're supposedly fooled by the West, and therefore they supposedly have to be um, saved from the West um, by the uh, by the Russians. Um, and uh, the term Banderovs, uh, many of us are familiar with that. What was often showed up with that was the term Nidabite Banderovs, which means those who have not been killed yet. Um, and so that really um, it, it sheds a, a brighter light on understanding of um, sort of not only that this was a um, discriminatory and dehumanizing uh, coverage, it was, it had elements of inciting violence. Um, um, it was constant guilt attribution, meaning um, that it is Ukrainian uh, fault and everything that, that came, that they staged violence and et cetera. Um, and this was presented as a threat. Um, Maidan and the government that was there was the, the words uh, junta and coup was used. So again, completely uh, a, a blatant lie, but not only it was lie, it was consistently uh, systematically developed to, pre uh, to present Ukrainians as inferior, to present Ukrainians as a threat, and therefore justify um, the, the military invasion and violence um, that is to um, unfold. And therefore, all the accusation of NATO is actually part of um, pretty typical um, uh, genocidal um, trick, so to speak, where it was blamed on NATO, right? Russia constantly um, blames uh, that they supposedly were defending uh, themselves from NATO. It is obvious that NATO presented no threat, and most certainly Ukraine presented no threat, um, not only because it was not part of NATO, but because Ukraine absolutely had no um, aims to ever um, attack Russia, but it's always it was always presented as a um, um, sort of choice to um, to to defend themselves, um, and uh, therefore the violence that came. Um, not only there were strikes and bombing, um, but we know that there were massacres, uh, there were rape chambers, there were torture chambers. Um, and uh, women were raped uh, by Russian soldiers being told that it is being done so they would never have Ukrainian children. Um, Ukrainian children were um, some killed and some, as we know, um, taken uh, to the specialized camp where camps where they are uh, being re-educated. <laughs> so all the attacks were, um, therefore done. So I will uh, pause here um, and I am uh, looking forward to uh, your questions. Uh, thank you very much for um, your attention um, and um, inviting me to uh, share my research with you.
Yeah, thank you. Thank you so very much. It was fascinating, Sophia. I love your presentation contents and the way you present it. And I, of course, admire the Ukrainian people infinitely. Born and raised in the former Soviet Union, I know full well that they had on Maidan to overcome deep fear of repression, not only for themselves, but also for their families, as it had been the custom of the former Soviet Union and KGB. I know and remember this very well, the fear and um, infinite respect for them overcoming it. Well, you are ready for the questions, I understand? Um, absolutely, um, absolutely. Um, okay, all right. Now, um, while we'll be waiting for people to type their questions and I allow myself to ask my own question. Were you personally, and you study Ukraine professionally, mm -hmm. were you sub uh, surprised when uh, Vladimir Zelensky was elected president? Huh? It was kind of a result of Maidan. I'm not sure that we can say it as a result of Maidan. Uh, because, of course, the first president that was elected after Maidan was uh, Poroshenko. Um, what is very yeah. important to remember that right after Maidan, as Poroshenko was in, in uh, was um, elected and then the Ukrainian parliament, um, uh, there were elections for the Ukrainian parliament in the fall, um, they were... These were completely uh, free elections. Uh, local and international observers uh, pointed out that they were um, definitely democratic elections. So um, with that, um, therefore Maidan won democracy, all right, won democracy back. Um, and with that opened up lots of opportunities for people with different backgrounds um, and sometimes perhaps um, surprising one because I, I would say with certainty that the choice of Zelensky was quite surprising. Mm -hmm. What we are often forgetting of course the major, uh, one of the major uh, Kind of questions and issues during those presidential debates after Poroshenko, um, and and this was the choice now that Ukrainians were mainly making between Poroshenko and Zelensky uh, when Zelensky essentially won, eventually won. And um, the the major focus was um, about the conflict with um, Russia, and um, and what we are often forgetting today is that um, Poroshenko took much more, uh, much stronger stance toward um, Russian aggression. And it was Zelensky um, who, won, uh, who won on the campaign of trying to find, um, trying to find solutions with uh, Russia. He said, if needs to be negotiated, I will sit down with him at the table. Um, he made Poroshenko ask Ukrainian people for forgiveness um, as so many Ukrainian soldiers died. Um, and it was understood, of course, it was not Poroshenko's, Poroshenko's fault, but um, it was that tiredness uh, from the war and Zelensky's um, claims that he would look for solutions, um, that in fact, it was one of the reasons he gained so much support. Um, but obviously it is not the peaceful solutions and negotiations that Putin was looking for, um, as uh, clearly the Kremlin's main aim was not a negotiation and um, having peaceful relations with Ukraine, but quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. Clearly Kremlin's aim was to invade oh. and occupy entire Ukraine. And as they openly say, erase Ukraine off of the map of the world. Um, so therefore that promise um, is um, uh, unfortunately could not have been fulfilled because it was impossible for oh. the part of Ukraine. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, he hoped that he would do it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, a message from John Donnellan, um, who is also a board member of Fulbright, New Jersey. Great presentation, thank you so much. And um, do you think, um, do you see peace within 2024? Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much, uh, great question. Uh, <laughs> I'll give you an answer that the peace is possible in 2024. Mm -hmm. um, whether it will be achieved, um, it is, or I should say Ukrainian victory is theoretically possible. If um, the Western countries, uh, rather than decreasing the aid as uh, Americans are sending signals, um, is already starting to happen, uh, but in fact, uh, continue and increase um, the, the military aid um, to Ukraine um, with providing launch, uh, long range um, rockets, with providing um, uh, the, uh, the F 16s, uh, providing artillery, um, that would absolutely. Um, help Ukraine to push um, Russian military out of uh, Ukraine. Um, it, it is just absolutely undoubtedly because of how much um, Ukrainians with, with Western training, with motivation to defend their country because, uh, and that motivation is just growing um, because with the experience of Russian occupation, with the horrific um, right, fascist style um, occupation and suppression and uh, humiliation and torture and massacres. Um, they are fighting for it. It's an existential threat. Um, on the Russian side, the only motivation is to show power, um, is to occupy, and it is much harder to motivate soldiers with that. They're continually there. Um, they, uh, they they like the idea of, of winning, I suppose. But of course, it is much harder on the Russian side to keep up with the Western and um, with the Western training that now Ukrainian soldiers are receiving, with the ar artillery that is far superior, with the uh, much better weapons uh, that are much better at targeting. Uh, right. And so, if lo logistics is break is broken down. Um, if just a little bit more Ukraine, rather than kind of the slow drip help, if you uh, yeah. were to to get a little bit more, a little bit stronger, that let's say, let's invest, uh, you know, one percent less than one percent more of our budget into the help, and so forth, just a few percent. If we do a little bit more, we gain by defeating. Right. Um, Russia, which is uh, sort of this openly um, imperialistic now state right. that tries to fight with the uh, mainly with war crimes, right. Um, right? If we do that a little bit more um, and break right. down Russian logistics, the the the, the Russian uh, front will never be able to sustain that. So it is possible, right. but the question is whether the Western uh, world will continue to stay united and increase uh, Thank you so much. Thank you ever so much. And you use a great word, slow drip help. Well, that's, that's true. So peace is theoretically possible to answer John's question. Now we have another question, Sophia, from um, yet another um, board member of Fulbright, New Jersey. Called your hanker. Uh, here is the whole question. The notion of Ukraine as yet another domino in an expansion of NATO eastwards resonates with many colleagues I have in the global south. And Holger is um, a political scientist himself, for you to know. The point is being made, he continues. If the equivalent had happened in the U.S. backyard, the U.S. would, as a matter of fact, intervened, and few people in the West, of course, would have objected. Examples such as Cuba, Grenada, and more recently Venezuela are frequently cited. Do you see similarities and or 
differences of these two regions? Mm -hmm. That is the question. Thank you very much. Uh, that is, of course, a great question, and and, and obviously, I'm familiar with this uh, debate that you're referring to. Um, I, I will answer that there is there is a fundamental difference uh, between U.S. former, right? Currently, uh, it's not the same uh, politics toward the areas you mentioned, but um, very different of that past. Um, and as uh, we're using it, NATO expansion somewhat playing into um, sort of Russian narrative. Here's the major difference with the growth of NATO. All those members that became part of NATO after the 1990s, after uh, the so-called uh, fall of the Berlin Wall, they became members voluntarily. As soon as they lost, uh, as soon as Kremlin um, announced that they would be leaving, as soon as the Soviet army and Soviet tanks started leaving um, Eastern European countries, um, they started uh, loudly knocking at the door of um, NATO for their own protection, because NATO is organization um, for democratic countries, um, or oh, it's meant to be, uh, for democratic countries that uh, seek protection and seek union and promise to help each other in case they are invaded. Um, back then, in the 1990s, um, lots of people laughed at, say, those Lithuanians who were saying, oh, we're expecting to, that Russia might try to do this again. Um, and um, nevertheless, uh, um, they were the ones who turned out to be, uh, to, who turned out to be right, um, is that uh, with the sort of this uh, post-imperial syndrome that resurfaced in Russia and with the authoritarian and imperialistic ideology that is embraced by lots of people um, in Russia who do support uh, Putin's um, choices, um, that is a serious threat. Um, and therefore, again, the so-called expansion of NATO is the choice by those countries who are sovereign countries and who have the right to choose. Um, and it is fascinating to me that you're referring, right, and we both know, right, that is discussed in so Latin America, it is discussed in, as you call the global south. Um, but what is interesting, that question in a way justifies imperialistic ideology, right? Uh, because we are we're expecting, uh, why is it that we should help Ukraine survive? Why is it that we should help Ukraine against the genocidal war um, of Russia? Um, shouldn't we allow Russia to get away with everything they are doing? Um, that, in again, um, is obfuscating of what's really happening. Uh, because the U.S., even with its worst choices in its foreign policy toward Latin America, never... <laughs> ever conducted something that Russia is doing, um, a full-scale invasion, bombing of civilians, rocket strikes of civilians, massacres, and torture chambers, um, right? This, uh, and, and, and kidnapping of children, et cetera, et cetera. So we cannot compare um, Russian aggression to anything that U.S. Uh, did before, neither should we justify and excuse Russia with any kind of mistakes uh, that U.S. have conducted before. That is morally wrong and should not be done. So if we justify Russian imperialism, uh, doesn't it de facto justifies anybody else's imperialism? <laughs> And so I think this framing of uh, the question um, should be addressed. Um, and therefore, most importantly, um, what we should come down to is rather than, um, again, that imperialistic thinking that allows uh, uh, global powers um, to divide the world in their sphere of interest, we should go down to the framework, uh, which I as a human rights scholar encourage, is of course that of international law, um, respect of uh, sovereignty, respect of territorial integrity, 
And okay. interestingly enough, just yeah, I see Fiona, just let me finish the sentence. In um, of course, in the case of Ukraine that gave up its nuclear weapons, third largest world nuclear potential uh, nuclear arsenal in exchange for the US, UK, and Russia to guarantee its territorial integrity. Right. So by uh, by giving up um, on Ukraine, uh, by letting Russia destroy, um, invade, destroy, erase from the map as the Russia claims they're trying to do, um, entire nation of 42 million people uh, make them flee or kill uh, the rest or uh, you know completely control the rest. Uh, we are obfuscating reality. And we are then allowing um, these atrocities to uh, to take place, which we should never do, neither from a point of morality, neither from a point of view of international law. Good. Thank you so much. I am citing the questions as they come up. All right. Now, Patricia Hutchinson is saying this was very helpful in filling in the background of the conflict for me. So. Do you feel that there would have been any other way to deal with the Russians considering the cost of lives? Is there something other that Zelensky or someone else could have done? Uh, just to clarify, they could have done something to prevent Russian invasion? Is that or, the question? Or counteract. Um, very interesting question. Um, we need to again go back to what is it that um, Russia claims is the aim. The aim is to erase Ukraine off of the map. Russian propaganda consistently uh, presents Ukrainians as um, inferior, as Ukrainian language as the one that shouldn't exist, and Ukrainian culture the one that has no right to exist and no place in the world to exist. Um, so we often kind of leaving out this very clear message that, that Russian officials, Russian state propaganda is uh, stating, uh, right? So um, I, what, what can we do against such... Um, imper it, it just uh, open imperialism. What can we do against attempt to invade uh, with the relying on on uh, war crimes? Right. What uh, can we do? The only thing in in history's past, and unfortunately, um, there was no negotiation tactics. Again, remember Ukrainians chose Zelensky. Um, who was Poroshenko signed numerous several agreements uh, right with Putin trying to agree trying to give up their control of eastern Ukraine um, etc the constant attempt to negotiation constant Ukraine's giving right. up of its uh, territories and the world essentially kind of swallowed um, Russian annexation of Crimea and Russian con de facto control of eastern Ukraine um, but that was never enough because as they openly say, their goal is to destroy Ukrainian identity and culture and anybody um, who wants to, to stand in their path. And they are very comfortable killing people in mass um, just so they can um, do that. So what can we do against imperialistic powers that are willing to throw, I mean, we're forgetting how much Russia has invested in how two, several hundred thousand Russian soldiers died in the war, yes. how many tanks, how many Russian planes, Russian military right now has been weakened and they keep the Russia, Russia has lost so much in their ability to sell their oil and gas. And they're not stopping because they're not after resources. They're not after anybody's lives because they bring only death and destruction. It is an ideological war um, to claim their superiority. So the only way to stop this is obviously force. Um, there's nothing, so much has been tried and the West has forgiven 
too much. The, the West has forgiven Syria, the, ignored Syria, ignored Georgia. We've forgotten about Chechnya and, and completely ignored of what actually was happening in eastern Ukraine. Um, but that encourages <laughs> rather than solves a question. Um, that impunity um, only encourages um, the, the, the Kremlin power and Kremlin aggression. So what could have been done to prevent uh, going back to the sort of the fundamentals of the question? If, the, if Ukraine would have been accepted into NATO, if um, Russia, if, if the armies went into the uh, a part of Ukraine, then Russia knew the price would have been too high. Um, and of course, lots of people wouldn't support that. Um, so many people Russia supported because they assumed it was going to be an easy three-day war. Uh, now they were obviously mistaken, but they wanted that imperialistic glory with, with a law price tag. <laughs> if they knew um, that, say, the West said, Ukraine gave up nuclear weapons in exchange of territorial integrity, we're going to honor that. Um, we are going to uh, to put our troops on the border and prevent Russian invasion. We're going to have our planes. We're going to have our tanks. We're going to have our rocket launchers. No, the, then the cost of that invasion would have been not only too high, but impossible. Um, right. Russia is losing to Ukraine. Right. 100% they would have lost to the NATO army. And that um only that would have prevented and now what can be what can be done to stop is is rocket launchers and planes that can push russian army and essentially that would be in russia's interest because dying for putin's war is not in the interest of russian citizens totalitarian regime is not in the interest of russian citizens and whatever remains um, right, uh, the, the more they lose, the less support for that war would continue to be in Russia. And, right. and that is the only possible solution. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Putting American boots on Ukrainian soil is Not out of the question. I, but, I, um, I, would, I, I didn't mean that. I said as a prevention, right? As right a prevention. Now, um, if we would have done that, or even provided enough weaponry, if we would have provided everything to prevent that, that could have been done. But right now, it's not uh, American boots that Ukrainians are asking, right? But the, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But the, the weapons, and that is enough to, for Ukrainians yeah. to defend themselves. Thank you. And a tiny question as a follow-up by Holger Henker. Um, Iraq, Vietnam... My lie, Hiroshima. Do you see any um, similarities, if at all? Just very briefly, please, Sophie. It is. It is. Um, so I'm not gonna be here to. So again, I'm human rights scholar. I'm, I'm not going to justify nuclear attacks by uh, U.S. on um, Hiroshima and nuclear attacks. I'm not going to justify a bombing of Dresden uh, because so many civilians died. Um, I'm not going to justify Soviet soldiers raping of J German women. Um, right? Um, none of the atrocities committed in the past, whether they were acknowledged um, and, and tried in European tri Tribunal, or they were ignored um, as the Soviet soldiers rape of German women, as essentially Hiroshima was never punished. So you're right to bring up the point that US policy um, in the past, and I can give you a much longer list, <laughs> right, of, of uh, you know, of uh, US foreign policy mistakes and, and um, but none of it, ever justifies what Russia is uh, doing. Um, right. And that essentially is the, the answer that we shouldn't say, well, just because Americans did something bad, uh, whether it's 50 years ago or whatever years ago, we should let Russia erase Ukraine and kill and, and torture and, and rape people in Ukraine. Um, I think that's where we can agree. Um, I, I'm not here to excuse anything that the U.S. has done, but we do need to remember that our moral compass 
um, is not everything that that Ukrainian uh, that that U.S. administration is doing in the past, especially. But the moral compass is international law, is respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity, is respect for somebody's culture and identity. And if you yes. come in, invade another country, and say we're going to kill you that somebody else's mistakes in the past should never excuse and we should never close our eyes on what is going on and what is Russia committing okay. today. Because we are then leading to inviting a completely new international order where those with more power and nukes can get away with anything, including right. genocide. That is right. not okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you for detailed answers. Thank you, participants. Thank you, attendees, for your very interesting questions for our discussion. And uh, most of all, thank you, Dr. Wilson, for coming and being here. We are very grateful. Thank you thank all. You so much. Thank you very much. It was an honor to be here. And thank you for great questions and inviting me to speak here. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye.